Hello friends. Hello friends. Hello friends. Hello friends. Um, I hope you're good. Um, this is Dr. T speaking. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm a second year medical intern, currently doing my internship in the Eastern Cape uh, in the Nelson Mandela Academic Hospital. And I'm currently rot rotating in family medicine. I mean the emergency unit for the next three weeks. Um, so without wasting any time, um, let's get into today's topic. What I want to share with you today is a, an approach to a chest pain. But in this approach to a chest pain, I'm going to lean more towards ischemic heart disease. Um, you know, when I was still a, a student, um, one, of the things that, one of the things that I realized is that um, when we study conditions, uh, heart failure, uh, hypertension, uh, ischemic heart disease, all those things, we sort of we, we somehow struggle to we can know the symptoms very well for those conditions but when a patient is put in front of us we struggle we struggle to move and the reason for that is because we have been uh, we have been um i don't want to have been to say we have been um okay the reason for that is because we try to study complex medical conditions but fail to realize that when a patient comes in through the door they won't come in with a diagnosis they want you to tell them the diagnosis so they won't come so you can know heart failure in and out but if you don't know what symptoms to expect from a patient and when they have those symptoms, can you be able to pick them up and start uh, to investigate them appropriately? So that's the big question. So today, you see, I'm not saying let's talk about ischemic, I want us to talk about ischemic heart disease, but the topic is chest pain. But I know we're going to end up talking about ischemic heart disease. Unlike if I, was, if I were to write our approach to to chest pain and I start writing causes of a chest pain this is where we always lose it I want us to write chest pain and approach a chest pain and find okay where are we gonna end up what sort of diagnosis are we gonna come up with I hope that you get this it's very 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 important it has always made my life uh, easy uh, when I started doing my clinical my clinical years so Let's do this. So an approach to chest pain. Approach to chest pain. <clears throat> Sorry. An approach to chest pain. So a patient that comes in with a chest pain So they've got, I mean, there are so many things that could be wrong with that patient. There are so many things that could be wrong with that patient. But as a doctor, you want to quickly uh, decide if you need to do something now about that chest pain. But what's going to help you is to rule out the things that will take a patient's life now. One of those is... a. Uh, MI, myocardial infarction. One of those is a pulmonary, pulmonary embolus. One of those is an aortic uh, dissecting aneurysm. Um, I'm forgetting another one that is also important as well. Hopefully I will remember it. So you want that because any other chest pain, except for those that I've mentioned and the one that I'm also forgetting, you can sort of like say, okay, what's happening and then you 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 you, you take it you it you, you put a bit of time but some conditions you don't have a, you don't have time at all one of those is an mi so how do you quickly approach a chest pain and as i said we're going to lean towards the mi side 
there is what is called a uh, clinical uh, chest pain classification clinic clinical chest pain classification <coughs> Clinical chest pain classification. So this clinical chest pain classification is the one that guides us to say, okay, the chest pain that we are seeing is highly likely to be a cardiac or non-cardiac. So it helps with that. So please use it. It's very important. It makes lives easy. So what are the things that you look at there? So the so it's a, it's, a, it's a symptom. It's symptom based. So the patient will say, "I have a a retro sternal chest pain or substernal chest pain." Same thing. Number two, they will say, "This pain, this chest pain that I have." is worsened by physical activity <clears throat> physical activity and this chest pain is relieved Is relieved by rest or taking nitrates like asosopide and uh, dinitrite. Di um, so, re retrosternal chest pain worsened by physical activity, and also sometimes patients will say worsened by uh, stress or emotion. Um, so <clears throat> this chest pain from there you will decide if this patient has got a typical chest pain typical chest pain or if they are having atypical or if they are having a non-cardiac chest pain non-cardiac chest pain <clears throat> when do we say a patient has got a typical chest pain and when do we say it's atypical when do we say it's non-cardiac so the typical means that means that the patient has got a chest pain and it's a typical cardiac chest pain so when you say that you are saying you have all of those three there, all of them. When you say it's atypical, it means you've got two, any combination there, but only two. <clears throat> Sorry, if it's non-cardiac, it means you've got one or you've got zero. That's a non-cardiac chest pain. So, once, once it's non-cardiac, it means now you can start entertaining non-cardiac chest pains that will still kill your patient. Like now, it's a, if it's non-cardiac, you look at musculoskeletal problems, you look at GIT problems, you look at lung pathologies, all those things. That's when it's non-cardiac. But if it's typical or atypical, if it's typical, you're going to run straight, quick examination and see if they, you don't need to resuscitate the patient. If you, you don't have to resist a patient at that point, you quickly do an ECG and um, so if it's typical and atypical, this is what you need to do. You can't trust atypical. Atypical does not mean it's not a, a, it's just that compared to this one, it's less likely compared to this one. But these two, 
they are still worth investigating. The investigations for this one, they will go like this. I'll show you now. Then the investigations for a non-cardiac, I will do another separate um, video. Because it's going to be very be too long if I do everything here. Sorry. So if it's typical or atypical, the next thing that you do is an ECG then. <clears throat> ECG. Once you do your ECG, your ECG can come back, can either come back normal or it can come back with changes. ST changes. So when you do an ECG on, a, on, a, on these patients, the first thing that you quick, want to quickly look at is your ST segment. Are there any changes there? If there are no changes, I'll talk about this when I come back now. now. So if there are changes, what kind of a change are you seeing? Are you seeing an ST elevation? ST elevation? ST elevation, then it means you have a STEMI. An ST elevation myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction. If you don't, if you, you if it's not a, a if it's, it's an ST def depression, then it means you've got an end STEMI. An end STEMI. A non ST elevation myocardial infarction. How do those appear on an, on, on, a, on an ECG? So if you've got an ECG like that, so an ST elevation, instead of it coming down like this and doing that and doing that and doing that, it's just going to do this and do that. That's an ST elevation. If it's an ST depression, this is not drawn according to scale. Eh? So instead of it, instead of it, it will go, it will go down. But instead of it going down and doing that and doing that and doing that, it's going to go down and do that. It's an ST depression. So, as, as you do that, you ask someone to take a blood. The blood that you want to quickly do is your troponin troponin and your CKMB and the other bloods obviously. The, the point here is that you've got this patient, typical, atypical. So you wanna decide if you need to treat them now or you don't have to treat them now. If they've got ST changes, you need to treat them. You don't wait for bloods to come because these bloods can take about, depending where you are, in other centers, you can get um, a bedside test for the troponin, and then you see it now. But in uh, in other places, like where I am, it's going to take you a few hours to get those those back. So you cannot be uh, um, you cannot be waiting for those bloods. So you need to make it to, to do an ECG, and the ECG, the ECG will tell you what to do. So if you've got changes, if you've got changes which have so these are changes you have changes you start to treat that patient and the treatment for these kind of patients um there's an acronym mona lisa mona lisa so m is for morphine oxygen nitrates aspirin um, um, I keep forgetting these two, these three, but this is starting. This is starting. The reason why you give them morphine is because an MI is very, ex is very uh, painful. So you want to help them with the pain. Give them oxygen because they might be having a, a reduced cardiac output. Because remember, one of the complications of an MI is a heart failure. And also, you want to maximize oxygen delivery to the part of the of the myocardium uh, that you um, to the cardio, to the part of the that you can still that is still patent. You want to maximize 
oxygen delivery there and um, you give uh, nitrates because they uh, they are dilate they are, they they dilate uh, they've got an uh, an ability to 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 vasodilate so the the the, the actions that you still have you can still maximize them and dilate them as much as possible to improve circulation and statins are just anti uh, uh, lipids um therefore cholesterol i'm gonna come back to you about the l the i and the and the a i've just forgotten and i'm just gonna put a comment on this video i've just forgotten yeah so so this is what you wanna do so this will come back later to say okay doc you have treated your patient yes this they confirm that your patient actually had an mi so the next thing this is just you're just buying time here what you need to do is to refer this patient to the cath lab so you can actually refer this patient to a cardiologist who will decide okay am i gonna thrombolize this patient or am i not gonna thrombolize this patient uh and later on so they can either thrombolize the patient uh, thrombolize thrombolize and then maybe later on depending how big the area of the infarct or how many vessels are involved they can go on and do cabbage cabbage so cabbage is coronary artery bypass bypass uh, graft so basically what you do do there is an operation so you take um uh you harvest a functioning vessel from somewhere and you go and create a bypass let's say you have um this is your heart this is your artery and now this area is dead because of this artery that is blocked so what you want to do you want to you want to connect this and use that harvested uh, vessel to bypass this so that you can perfuse this again and just bypass this that's one way one one of the um, most commonly used uh, um, vessel is the saphenous vein the great saphenous vein and uh, sometimes they can also use uh, the internal mammary artery. Remember, the internal mammary artery runs along the, the sternum. So it's easy to just divert it to the heart. Remember, its connection is, direct, is directly from the... If I'm not mistaken, I'm going to check this up as well. If it's, if it's the aorta or it's the subclavian. But it's directly from there. So... The blood is supposed now to go down and supply the breast and the other uh, uh, intercostal spaces. It just goes now to the heart. So you use it to bypass um, this. So basically, that's that's what they do there. Um, and then let's come back to this side. So that's what you would do for that patient. And when you do that, you have not m missed a myocardial infarction. You can't miss it because you have done there. The correct steps and the right things so coming to this side now your patient has got a typical chest pain or a typical chest pain but the ecg is normal so it means that for the ecg to be normal chances of them having an mi are very um, uh, small but what do you do with them you say okay i'm gonna keep you in the hospital i'm not gonna discharge you i'll keep you in the emergency unit or or admit you to a cardiac unit while I'm waiting for bloods. You do the bloods as well. Do the bloods, the same bloods, the traps, and the CKMB. Okay, while I'm still here, maybe you're asking yourself, why would you do both traps and CKMB? Remember, traps are a new thing. In the olden days, they used to use CKMB as the only cardiac marker. But now there's TROPS. But why would I still do, do the two of them? Um, the reason why, personally, I always do the two of them because of this. 
troponin they take a few minutes and few minutes maybe 30 minutes 45 minutes an hour to go up and then they take uh about six seven hours to go down so they are beautiful to diagnose an acute mi and mi that is happening now they are very beautiful but if this patient had a chest pain last week at home that was their, their first mi and then they come to you and they're having a second mi because this one is more serious you cannot pick up that last week's mi on the blood if you only do chops because by that time they would have dipped the one that you would say now let's say they, they they had a chest pain but they are only coming to you to tell you that dog actually i had a chest pain but i didn't get a chance to come can you please check what's wrong if you do chops they would be normal because it would have been a week or days later but when you do a CKMB, you can still pick up that MI. So a CKMB takes a few days to pick up and takes a couple of weeks to go down. So that's why it's important to do the two of them. So our ECG is normal this side, but our bloods are also normal. So what do we say now? So these patients, these uh, uh, patients are struggling, are having a... Um, an a stable angina and an unstable angina so this is where now we can put them angina remember these are ischemic heart disease ischemic heart disease mm. because they present the same according to this classification, they present the same so you cannot differentiate them you cannot differentiate one from the other without doing ecg and biochemistry so under ischemic heart disease you have what is called acute coronary syndrome and acute coronary syndrome is unstable angina and STEMI and a STEMI. those are acute coronary syndromes the two mi's are acute coronary syndromes then this one unstable angina so if your patient has got typical chest pain or, a, or atypical chest pain but normal uh, ecg and normal blood now you need to decide are you putting them here or are you putting them here are they having a stable angina or are they have having an unstable angina so there isn't a clinical test that you can use to that i know of that you can use to differentiate unstable angina from a stable angina actually you can do um okay firstly history will be important here because your patient will tell you that actually i get this chest pain when i'm walking or i get this chest pain when i'm running then that's a stable angina but if they say i get this chest pain even when i'm just sitting watching tv or sleeping then that's an unstable angina that's how you can differentiate. Some people would say you can take these patients and do a stress test. So you take them on a treadmill and then you ask them to run. Obviously with your research equipment around. If when they got into the treadmill they were fine, but after a few seconds or a few minutes running, they start getting a chest, uh, then you will know that this one is, is a stable angina that they are having. Because they had to be active in order for them to get that. I hope we are together.